for the two-day seminar, okay? The question for the two-day seminar is, can a person have periodontal disease before there is bleeding or tissue breakdown or any of the clinical signs or symptoms? Now think about that question. Can they have periodontal disease before we can see it? This, ha this question has really deep roots, okay? And this will take us places. And the next time you see a patient that has a little tiny itty bitty amount of bleeding, right? Little tiny bit of breakdown. This is the question that should pop up. Do they have periodontal disease or don't they? Okay, think like a doctor. Do you have a little tiny bit of infection or don't you? Okay. So what is periodontal disease? Well, historically we've been taught what? When it shows up and I can see it and I can measure it, then I can make the diagnosis, right? And it used to be you had to have radiographs to be able to do that, which is like three to six months after everything goes to pot, clinically, right? At least. At least. It takes a while for the bone to finally dissolve away, but by then it's way too late, the horse is out of the barn. So periodontal disease to us, is, as clinicians and diagnosticians, in quotes, has been clinical destruction, bleeding upon probing, okay? Now, obviously, if they're bleeding upon probing, that should be like a no-brainer, right? But it still begs this other question, can they have periodontal disease without bleeding and those other things? Well, we've taken some big steps forward, and I think it's going to take a few years for this really to infiltrate, but it starts at no less than even our own AAPs, where they've done this workshop on inflammation. You can, when you get this, you can Google it and go there and read all this, and it's very, very fascinating what's going to be happening in the next two years, five years, and ten years in terms of their time windows for where this is all going. Very much of it is going to be revolving around blood chemistry and salivary diagnostics as we go into the future. Can you imagine, I mean, this is really key, can you imagine over the next decade the emerging science leading us towards diagnosing and managing periodontal disease using blood chemistry, DNA analysis, and the systemic treatments alongside our traditional measures? That's where this is going, even according to our own AAP. So the question is, how will this impact the physician and the dentist's role with regard to periodontal disease? Well, this is what I am beginning to discipline myself to do. I'm asking if the patient has had recent blood work. Ask if it included CRP, HbA1c, which is the diabetic indicator. I want to get a copy from the physician or refer the patient to a lab or blood test or ask the MD physician how to proceed, you or them. It just brings us up to in front. It's like, this is a problem. We need this data. This is part of the picture. Where do we go? Okay. And we have to be careful as dentists. We are not physicians. We have to be real clear about that. Our license, and we may think we're smarter than them in some areas, and we are when it comes to the mouth, but we're still not the medical doctor, and we're not licensed to be the medical doctor. So we have to respect that and try to co-manage and work with or encourage that process the best that we can. With regards to the salivary or curricular flow diagnostics, we have bacterial DNA uh, using uh, the PCR uh, that, that's now out. Uh, also doing host susceptibility, we're finding out what is the, what's the status of their interleukin-1 uh, genes. Uh, the goal is to have early detection and predictable treatment. And then here's the next question. What will dentistry do? It's a thought question. What will dentistry do when medicine gains the capacity to diagnose periodontal disease using salivary fluid diagnostics and the diagnosis becomes at least in part molecular based. Furthermore, what are we going to do when this technology becomes over the counter and I can go to the drugstore and buy a testing strip, mm -hmm. dip it in my own saliva and read it in some fashion that says, yep, you have gum disease. There's some really thought provoking and challenging questions as to how we're going to proceed because from what I understand, that's what's coming because of this. So we have to start thinking differently. If we're going to stay in practice, if we're going to take advantage, if we're going to be on the, on the leading edge of this, we have to start thinking. This is not about notched metal sticks, you know, making things bleed. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is a whole new paradigm as to how we're going to proceed into the future. Um, the diagnosis of the subgingival microflora, uh, oral DNA, uh, with Dr. Tom Neighbors, um, either using paper points or now the swish spit um, uh, technology that they have, producing reports that tell me what kind of bacterial complexes that we have going on. 
Um, it's very accurate according to all the research that's been done. Uh, again, what's going to happen when this becomes available to the physician? When the physician can say wrench spit and it's part of a broader genetic panel, what if they could go in there and do two or three or four hundred tests with one wrench spit and send it off and get, about, get a, you know, a ten or a hundred page report of your whole human genome and everything that goes with it that tells me all this information as well. That's what's coming. The physicians will have the ability to do that. I can tell you what, 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 the, what the people behind this are wrestling with is, is how to make it commercially viable and how to introduce it and to make it cost effective. The science is already there. Interleukin-1 uh, genetic susceptibility, um, poly, interleukin-1 polymorphisms, and that just means there's a gene defect, that word. Uh, they're, they, are, they make you susceptible to excessive inflammatory response uh, and makes the effects of systemic inflammation more pronounced, which is why some people can have these problems uh, that you can measure, but they're, they're not sick and they don't get sick, and others become very sick because they have a propensity to an exaggerated response to these pathogen-associated molecular patterns, endotoxins, and so forth. Um, and that's just the genetic expression. Just because you have the gene, just remember, doesn't mean that you're going to get sick. Just because I have a gene for cancer doesn't mean I'm going to get cancer. There has to be a genetic expression before the phenotype represents itself. So we can get a negative or we can get a positive result back, and this is a clinical thing now. Okay, so what am I going to do as the clinician? If I know a patient is, is interleukin-1 positive, it might influence my, my treatment decisions, especially if I have things that are, are predisposing them to not be well, such as diabetes and, and gum disease and so forth. So the question is, what benefit would there be to knowing the genotype before we begin treatment? Or do we just say, well, I don't know, let's just clean you up and see how you do. We'll check and see if in six months things are better. Well, I don't know. It's a question. You know, think like a doctor. Um, you know it's not strep throat, right? But what does he do every time? He swabs your throat, and we just have to find out and make for sure. And you go right along with it. It's not a big deal. So the positive genotype, it does not always mean that there's going to be the, uh, the sickness show up, but we need to know it, and it's, it's what's beneath this. Uh, just as an aside, um, uh, Ortec also has a, a BANA test uh, that you can use. This is also a salivary diagnostic where you, put, you, you dip the, uh, the fluid in, on the strip, and it shows up a certain color after it processes, and, the, and if it's there, then it just tells you it has the enzyme for the red complex bacteria. The advantage here is it's just a few dollars. Um, 